so delighted to be joined by Chris and Kig to, to preview this weekend's uh, provincial football finals. Um, Chrissy, obviously you're one of the few players that got to, to play in the, the Intercounty Championship this year. Um, how did you find the, the couple of months? Um, look, it was uh, it was definitely very different um, from a preparation standpoint alone. Um, was different, and to be to be quite frank, it was uh, it was quite difficult. I suppose the only the only saving grace was that you knew that it was quite difficult for every team. And mm -hmm. I think the more you talk to people and you see now all the different reactions, I think it does at home that the country needed GA back in some capacity, even if it was just watching it from your armchair. I think it's 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 become a release for a lot of people and um you know it's been great to have it back, albeit a lot of teams probably uh voyage in the county or in the championship this year has been short lived. But again, look, it's been interesting to watch. It's been good to have games back on the T V again and it's been good, you know, from a from a from the from the standpoint of it it's at least created discussion and interest and it's been a welcome distraction away from talking about COVID and all the different things that have surrounded COVID. Yeah, I mean, the championship game he did play was against our man. He'd never really lost out by a couple of points. How did you find the, the no fans there? It was just, did it feel like a, a training ground sort of game or did it feel uh, like a proper championship game? I different. I, 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 the crowd, I suppose, for me, wasn't as big a factor because I suppose you knew that it was championship and you also knew that it was live on TV. BBC showed the, the game live and um, you were aware of that too. But um, championship day is usually surrounded by a big enough crowd and uh, I suppose that that's there's no point in lying. It, it's, a, it's a big, big difference. But um, I wouldn't have said that it, 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 it helped us or, or actually hindered us. And now it's became almost the new norm in world sport, um, and uh, many many uh, sections of the world that there's just no supporters there. So uh, it's became the new normal, and um, it's like everything else. Once you use something for a while, you don't really think too much about it. Yeah, because it is interesting. Probably earlier in the year, people say, "Oh, we don't want behind closed doors," and then it, of course happened, and we're all we'll, we'll just take anything at this stage so that people's opinions change as it goes on. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it did it did get to the stage where people just wanted sport back as long as it was safe to do so. I think we sometimes underestimate the power of sport. Sports more and always has been for me anyway, much more than just kicking a ball around a field. Mm -hmm. um, it represents so much more. What it gives to people um, is you know undescribable in many ways. And uh, look, J is a massive part of this country. It's a massive part of people's lives. Um, it's the fabric of our community, so um, it's it's nice to have it back. And when we when we are moving closer to having people back watching games again, you know that's going to be a positive. But I still probably hand on heart think we're maybe a little bit away from that just yet. Yeah, uh, in terms of this weekend's games, um, probably the bookies don't reckon there'll be too many many upsets. Um, you'd have to probably think that. The one upset that probably could happen might be Tipperary against Cork. Uh, Tipperary play Cork most years now for the last four or five years and caused them problems. Um, they beat them a couple of times as well. Obviously, Cork took out one of the big guns in Kerry and now suddenly the expectation is that they're going to win a Munster title and, and progress to a semi-final. Well, naturally, you would, you would have to be fair to Cork and, and, and say that if you're beating Kerry in a championship game, naturally the expectations are that you would go on and one monster, you, you know, quite often you would maybe play Kerry in the monster final also two one monster. So, um, I, I don't think the expectation will bother Cork too much because, from from what I've heard and playing in the league this year and even watching them last year, the, their progress has been steady. Um, they put in a huge work. They're in physically fantastic shape. They were able to compete, and at times perhaps dominate Kerry physically. Mm. So they're at the level. Um, you know, granted, Tipperary have a have a couple of really really good players. Quinn Levin and Sweeney are two two of the best forwards that there is about at the minute in any team. So naturally, you know, when you have players of that caliber, you're going to be causing any team's problems. But I think for Cork now, their their aim is to 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 back up what they did against Kerry. I don't think what they did against Kerry was a flash in the pan. 
I think it was coming for a while. Now, I didn't expect him to beat Kerry, but I did expect him to be hugely competitive. And, you know, maybe they were a small bit fortuitous. And, you know, sometimes you need that to, you know, to get over the line and make the breakthrough as the underdog. But I, I still think no one can can uh, say that they didn't deserve it in the end. And uh, <laughs> Tipperary, for me, haven't been as good in the last last year or so as they have been prior. They're maybe, they may be building again. Um, I hope we're not building too much because they're in the same division as us next year. But, you know... Um, Tipperary around 16 were, were in the Lorna semi-final or 17 one of the, one of the years yeah. they beat all the qualifiers so um, they always have that kind of um, ability to upset but I, I think Cork can win this game this weekend by um, a relatively good margin you know possibly 5-6 points yeah, it's probably Cork maybe could be maybe a year or two ahead of their development. And you, you know, they threw the the league out of the window, if you like, because you rarely see Division 3 teams beat Division 1 teams. So um, they would have been probably hoping to put up to Kerry and maybe get most again out of Division 2 and then step up. But they're, they've knocked out Kerry and still be really looking at this as a huge opportunity with Kerry gone now. Absolutely. And I think, I think the biggest thing for any team is... and especially a team that, you know, like a sleeping giant as such, like, like the Cork football team is silverware. Um, you, see, you see the domination that Donegal have done in Ulster at silverware more often than not all the time. And, you know, one on the odd game here and there is grand, but when you get to a final and there's a chance to win silverware, you know, um, you take them opportunities when they come along irrespective of what of what division it is in the league or irrespective of what provincial championship it is, you know, you make sure you won them because that's what Kerry and Dublin or Mayo inevitably do too. So um, you take stock from them and I would say, yes, Cork will be looking at Tipperary this weekend naturally, but I would say if you're inside the Cork camp, their biggest thing is to back up the game against Kerry and secondly, get a Monster Championship because it's been quite a while since they got that. Yeah, and obviously there's talk of Colin Reardon now for, for Tipperary as well. Obviously you played a bit of uh, AFL. How, how hard is it to, to transition between both or is it that hard once you, you have it in, in you, kind of you play it through underage and that? I think it's got to the stage now where it's certainly harder. Um, I, I was relatively lucky that when I came back, it, it, tinned me, it took me a bit of time but not as long as maybe some other boys but I think it's a conversation that doesn't be talked about too much that there's been a lot of fellas that have gone away to Australia and come back again after whatever number of years and they have played very little county football or the county football they have played has been without too much of a of an impact so um, that can't be understated I mean your big fella, Keen, who, who who scored the goal against Kerry, but with all due respect, up until that moment, he hadn't got a massive impact. And you were thinking, has the Cork management made a massive call here that could be to the detriment? But luck, a wee bit of luck came in and, and he finished the goal fantastically well. You can see what a fantastic player he was when he left and he, his physicality and, at, and his physical attributes are unbelievable. But you go away and you play any game for a period of time and you don't play Gaelic football at the top level, you're going to struggle. So Colin Reardon, who was an unbelievable Gaelic footballer when he left and he was instrumental for Tipperary um, and the Honour 21 campaign, I, I just, as a manager, I, I just don't know why you would want to be taking that type of risk. Now, whether they will use Colin Reardon or not or whatever, but... Um, Maybe it might be a side distraction for Cork or something like that, but um, I think it's usually difficult to come back from playing any sport, never mind AFL, to play elite Gaelic football. People also underestimate the level that our games are at. Gaelic football now at county level is just unbelievable. The physicality, the tactics, the conditioning, the decision that can required, you know, it is, it's, it's elite sport. It falls under the bracket of elite sport, and deservedly so. So some people underestimate this tag of, oh, you're a professional athlete, you should come in and dominate Gaelic games. That, that is simply uh, not the way it works. And uh, um, sometimes we have to take a step back and say, you know, 
Gaelic footballers that are playing elite Gaelic football um, are very, very talented people. Yeah, because you mentioned Mark, he obviously does get the goal, but as I said, it could work the other way. Like, he's just walked into, or same with Arreary, he's just walked into a panel and the other yeah. lads have been training away and he's just basically skipped ahead of them. So it could go either way, really. Absolutely. Yeah, big, big call from the Cork management, you know. Um, big, big call from the Cork management and that probably very close to not paying off <laughs> the last couple of seconds. But look, fortune favours the brave. It did work. It did create history. He did get the goal. Mm. His confidence is going to be sky high again. And fairness to Mark Keane, I'm not sure he's a full forward. Mm. I, he seems to be more, you know, um, more comfortable around the middle of the pitch, you know, probably somewhere like that. But in that particular game, Cork didn't need any more bigger presence around the middle of the pitch. They probably needed a tall presence on the edge of the square, and that's what they got with him. But look, it was a big call. Colin Reardon, um, from what I've seen of him playing Gaelic football, and you know, he, he is an awesome Gaelic footballer and he's done really, really well in Sydney. But um, to come back in for a monster final, have not played Gaelic football at that level for quite a number of years, um, that's a huge ask. Huge ask. Yeah, the, the game on Saturday then is um, Saturday night's Dublin meet. Um, again, it's hard to see Dublin losing this or even being under pressure come the last 10 minutes. You'd have to imagine they'd have enough to beat me. But me there, Improving, but you know, the Division 1 like, seems to be standing some of the a strong second half performance against Kildare, um, but they'd have to put in the performance of their life to, to, to beat Dublin. Uh, look, it's, you've hit the nail on the head, but um, uh, it sometimes become a very, it becomes a very tired analysis when we talk about Dublin and whoever they're playing, doesn't it? It's always a yeah. similar kind of narrative. It's kind of said with a sigh, and you're saying, uh, you know, it's not going to happen and that's granted Dublin have earned that right you know there's no other team in the competition that have the ability to go out and beat you know Leash who are a decent division 2 team by 20 plus points there's no yeah. other team in the competition that has the ability to do that so that's granted what I will say is Meath have been hugely impressive to me because of the fact for the last four years they have built something they have learnt they have took some bad beatings they have had some bad days but I tell you what you talk about a team that, to me, has improved massively. And they were very unlucky in Division 1 this year. Most of their games went down to a point or two. And that was even against Dublin. Um, they have been hugely, hugely competitive. Physically, I think they're unbelievable. They've clearly won the wins on a load of work there. Tactically, they've massively improved. And from what I see this year, they have three or four players in the forwards that can cause anybody problems. Now... I think you're right. They will be competitive with Dublin to a certain extent. But, you know, you would have to fancy Dublin to pull away. But Westmeath, you know, I think Meath are, you know, a fair bit better than Westmeath at this present time. And Westmeath, you know, we're, we're relatively competitive. OK, Dublin were probably cantering in the end. But look, I think the two best teams in Leinster are in the Leinster final. That's what I will say. How much will be in the game? I don't know. But I think it's safe to assume that Dublin are going to win the game. Yeah, because you could even go as far back as last year's Super 8s with me. That they lost all three games, but you look at they were I think, either beating Donegal by a point or level with them in the second half. Mayo, they were level or winning again 50 minutes gone, and they put up to Kerry in, in that. So sometimes you have to take these losses, but against the big teams, and it'll, it'll improve you in the long run. Absolutely. And that's, that's it's such lazy analysis and tired analysis for me that, you know, most of the punditry out there, most of the people out there, all we want to talk about is Dublin, Kerry, and whoever the next two best are. You know, nobody has come out and says about the work that Meath have done. No one has come out and said about the improvement that Cork have, 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 have did. No one's come out and said that the, the achievement of Cavan to get to two Ulster finals in a row, despite mm. being unluckily relegated to Division 3. You know, people have to have to broaden the horizons in terms of looking at other teams and the work they're doing. Every team in Ireland is trying their best to improve. Every county is trying their best to improve. And, you know, we can't go down the route of just thinking there's only three or four teams worth looking at or analysing. You know, there's loads of teams doing a lot of good work. And from what I see, Meath have done a lot of good work. OK, they've got relegated Division 2 this year. But, but you know, chances are they're going to get promoted back to Division 1 next year. Like, like... I would say Roscommon fall into a similar bracket as Meath. 
maybe not as good as Meath, arguably at, the, at present, but they're clearly a county and clearly a setup that are doing a lot of things right. And uh, that has to be admired, you know, and to close that gap in the top three or four is an unbelievably difficult task. But there's so many counties that are trying to do that, you know, and Armagh probably fall under that bracket too, playing Division One for the first time in a long time. You know, um, sometimes a lot of people don't understand the amount of work and effort and detail these setups are putting in to try and get into Division One and Two and try and bridge that gap. So um, I would have a huge amount of admiration for the Meath management and their players at present. Yeah, there's two Dublin players that are standing out at the moment is Kieran Kilkenny and Brian Fenton. You know, Kieran Kilkenny, I argue, is the best player at the moment on form in, in the country. Again, another one for uh, Fenton just eases through a game. So you'd have to look at Brian Minton and possibly Donald Hogan to try and at least... If they can nullify them, then of course Dublin have other players, but they, they, they're look, two big ones. Yeah. yeah, look, all you can do is try and nullify the, the best the best vets. Kieran Kilkenny, I would agree with you. Kieran Kilkenny at present, I've never seen him play better. Um, he's scoring, he's creating, he's he, he's doing everything really. Um, but you're you're right. If you, if you tight it has shown in the past with Dublin, if you blunt some of their main players, then all naturally all one step up. What I will say is, you know, if you do blunt out Kieran Kilkenny and Brian Fenton, Dublin at the end of the day are still only human. And that is that is significant progress, you know. Now, I, I still think that Con O'Callaghan is, is arguably Dublin's pound for pound best player. Um, and, and if we see him turn it on, Dublin are a different proposition. But if you can nullify them three, easier said than done, then, you know, you're going to be competitive. Um, and, you know, Donald Hogan, I think, has the ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kieran Kilkenny, you know, to a fair to a fair degree. Menton in the middle of the pitch has certainly got the physicality for Brian Fenton. You know, he has to obviously honour him, tracking him back and stuff like that. But then, again, it's your next best defender putting on, you know, Con O'Callaghan or Dean Rock or Mannion or whoever they play. Um, so you're right, Dublin have more options than anybody else, and that's why we're talking about a team that's going for six in a row. Yeah, because it's even highlights that Cormac Costa came off the bench the last day and got seven points straight away. Paul Mannion's looking for a spot back, you know, likes of Buckler, uh, John, uh, Paddy Small, uh, Tom LaHitt's now come in. You know, it's every year that add one or two, and the competition is always there. Competition's always there, look, granted, and, uh, you know, that's fine. Dublin are still the team to beat. Um, but, uh, you know, um, I still I think there's one team this year more than anyone else that will give them their full of it. And I think they're going to be Ulster champions on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, because we were, we were still going to move on to that one. Uh, I see nothing but a Donegal win here. I think it'll actually be the largest margin, I think. I think Donegal will win this comfortably enough. Cavan have done, done brilliantly to get to an Ulster final. Um, but if they give a lead like they gave Monaghan and um, Johnny Gold will, will absolutely just they won't, they won't give him a sniff yeah been hugely impressed with Johnny Gold I was down down at the game doing uh, working for BBC at the last game or my and Johnny Gold and I suppose I, I, I put my uh, I put my neck above the chopping block and said I thought it was going to be a hugely competitive game and the first 15 minutes or 17 mm. minutes it was 3-2 or 2 all or something mm, like yeah. that and it was everything I expected. Um, I was hugely impressed with Armagh this year and the progress they made. We had played them. I thought they were physically really, really good. And I thought they, 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 they were open not to beat Donegal, but to have a real tilt at them. But Donegal absolutely blew them away um, in the second, second half of the first half. And there was no way back after that. And it wasn't for want of trying. Armagh tried to the very end and produce some decent play, but Donegal were just unbelievable. It was as good a display as in Donegal in a long, long time. Uh, defensively, offensively, on their own kickout against on the opposition's kickout, they had every box ticked. Rochford has made a huge, huge improvement for Donegal, and um, I think that group of players in Donegal, now whoever they play, they'll 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 they'll, they'll no doubt respect them. But I think that group of players from Donegal from the outside look to me like a group that want to play Dublin and want to beat Dublin to show that they're as good as Dublin. Now, people might disagree with that or whatever else,
but that's not up to other people. I, I feel that's what that Donegal group believe. And I tell you what, um, I think they can be hugely, hugely competitive with Dublin if that fixture arises. Yeah, because they did, in that, after that water spray, what Dublin would do. They just blitzed Armagh, they smelled blood, and just went for them. And they took the game away with, away from Armagh uh, in that 15 minute, minute period. They did. They were unbelievable. And the biggest thing is, I suppose, first hand, you get a better appreciation or you know, playing against Armagh. I thought Armagh were at the physical level required to compete with the very best because Derry have, you know, have, have that type of ground to make up. We, 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 we firmly believe that our biggest challenge is getting to a physical level that allows you to compete with the very best teams. And Armagh were, uh, were, Armagh were, were ahead of Derry, but Donegal are ahead of Armagh. And Don, Donegal are probably you know, top three teams, I would say. Um, you have Mayo, you have Donegal and Dublin. And I think pound for pound physically, um, and conditioning ways, they're they're the three best teams in the competition that way. And the Donegal team against Armagh, the the running power, um, how they're able to vary their game. So they, they were using the mark quite a bit, kicking the ball inside. Mm, yeah. Murphy was one of his own ball, although Forker had a very, very good game on him. You had Brennan in the corner who was electric. You had you had uh, you had uh, Thompson wing half forward who's been fantastic with Donegal this year. Uh, you have Ryan McHugh chipping on the point. You have McFadden from the middle of the pitch, who's been brilliant for them. Um, and you have uh, Patter Mogan, who was man of the match against Armagh from wing back, who is a real star to you in the mix. And so um, they have a really good age profile. There seems to be an unbelievable chemistry within that Donegal group. I think it's some stat like it's their, is it their ninth Ulster final in 10 years or eighth yeah. or ninth, something like that. So, you know. That's what domination looks like. Similar pattern to Dublin, albeit on a provincial level. Um, it could be, I think we're in the path for two, for two giants to meet each other this year. Yeah, because the interesting thing with Donegal is Mur Murphy, by Michael Murphy's standards, not having the effect that he might usually have. Uh, Paddy McBrayer, if you only came on the last day as well, we have, as I said, Morgan, uh, Michael Langan, I thought, really stepped up, and, and Thompson and, and the halfbacks, Owen Von Gallagher, um, and Ryan yeah. Hewitt, per usual. Like, they're just, there's players everywhere. They're not relying on Murphy and McBrayer here. We can just do it all by themselves. Yeah, and that's, 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 that's the sign of a really good team, you know. And, and <clears throat> people have said that Michael has been quiet the last two championship games, which by his own high standards he has. But it, when you watch him, he's so selfless and he's such an mm. integral part of that team. But people tend to forget too that he was outstanding through the National League. Absolutely outstanding through the National League. And he had yeah. a brilliant year last year. So I would like to think that when it comes to the big, when they really need him, he'll be, he'll be, he'll be available, you know. Langan, you're right, has, has, has probably been done a goal, maybe standout player, which is some, which is some statement, you know. Um, so Donny, Donegal, like... Like Dublin and like probably Mayo to a lesser extent, have serious and genuine competition for the starting fifteen. And unless you have genuine competition for the starting fifteen, whether it be at club level or county level, well then you know you aren't really a contender for one of the big honours. You need that competition within the squad. And I suppose I'll qualify that by saying competition's grand, but nothing trumps the quality of competition. And as we mentioned there. When Paddy McVerty is not starting at the minute, um, when you name the, the list of stars not starting for, for uh, Dublin, um, then you start to know that you're a serious contender. Um, I mean, it, it is hard to make the case for them coming close to Donegal, but I think, is it in our mind that the pitch is there a talk of that that might be a, a leveller if, if there was a bit of rain or something and the pitch was. Um, Cut up a bit to make it a bit closer, but again, it, it probably is a step too far. Yeah, look, Armagh Ar Ar traditionally has, has one of the best pitches in Ulster, and I see from different photos this week that they're that they're relaying the goal mouse and relaying the the parts of it. But Armagh traditionally is one of the best pitches in Ulster and one of the firmest sods. So uh, we're we're very lucky in Ulster as a province. I mean, I walked across Breffney before the Donegal Armagh game, and you wouldn't have believed how good it was. It was literally. Yeah. You, the ball was bouncing over your head and Armagh will be like that on Sunday I believe whether it's wet or not because Armagh has 
the ground staff and traditionally the pitches, we'd have played a lot, with Slaniel, we'd have played a lot of football and hurling provincial games there. And it wouldn't matter if it was the 1st of January, the 1st of July, the pitch is, believe it or not, very, very similar, hard, um, and, you know, ready, ready, ready to be played a bit decent football on. So, no, I, 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 there's too much of that being made. I think, I think, um, I suppose Kevin's, Kevin's only advantage is they played a Champions League in Armagh this year where it's done a goal having. But look, Kevin have, have some really good footballers. The problem for Kevin is is uh, quite simple. There's so many fires to put out in the Donegal team that Kevin just don't have them. And with all due respect, I don't think any other team in Ulster has them, maybe bar Tyrone. Tyrone are still the second best team in Ulster and have been relatively close to Donegal with all due respect to them. They have been. So Donegal are now dominating Ulster. They're going to be hard put off that perch. Um, sometimes predicting scores can be misleading because in fairness to Armagh uh, against Donegal on the weekend past, I don't think Donegal are 12 points better than Armagh, to be honest. They're, they're, they're probably, in most days, seven or eight points. Um, and I think, I think that's fair enough to say, because Armagh are not as bad as they played either. Um, and, you know, seven or eight points in a championship is still a, fair, is still a fair deficit. But it could be something similar against Calvin. And, uh, you know, and, and, and championship football at that level, you know, seven or eight points is a considerable margin. Yeah, and then just to, to wrap up, a few questions were sent in. Uh, one about the uh, talk, obviously, about the, the split season um, with the club and the county. Um, the club championship was probably as successful this year as it has been in quite a while. You know, it was just a sustained period of time of players training together. There's no distractions or anything. Um, would you be in favour of something like that? Like that? Yeah, I think it has to happen. Um, fixtures has been a long, a long-standing. Uh, Annoyance for me, and um, I, I, I think that's the way forward. I think it's very, very straightforward, very, very, sim- you know, very, very simplistic, and how it would be laid out. I don't think there's too many people that say it wouldn't be a good idea. Um, keeping keeping the county and the club schedules freer, and condensing at times, especially under a county, the time between the games has to be a no-brainer. The county season is far too long drawn out. Um, and there's no sense in it. I mean, there's no momentum that can be gained from having a three-week break, no matter if you're one or losing games. So that's a real positive, and I think everybody will be happier. And you know, it gives the club, it gives the club schedule more life. It gives it more respect, and I, I think everybody will be more appreciative. Of it. I think there's more of an understanding and more of appreciation coming around now how important club life is to people. And I suppose that's one of the positives of the, of the of the COVID is. A lot of people have maybe not got their love for club life back, but maybe it's became more apparent to them how important their club is and how unique and special the club championship is, because it is. And it's, it's, the, it's the lifeblood of our association. Those that are fortunate enough to play county football is grand, and it's, it's a short enough window, but, I mean, your life with your club is a lot longer term and, you know, in many ways, is just that tiny bit more special. So... Um, I think the split season would be a really positive, positive move for all of us involved in the GA. Uh, another one would have been um, here is the thoughts on Mayo. Actually, they're, they're obviously the only team at the moment that are in the last four guaranteed. Um, two good wins against Roscommon and Galway. They've had to their battle way through Connacht, which is never easy. So, uh, how do you see them going? I think Mayo. Um, it's difficult to know. Um, Part of me still believes that whilst it's admirable of the brand of football they play, I still think if they play as open and as free-flowing as they're currently playing, that a Jimmy Brennan, a Michael Murphy, a Langan, a Con O'Callan, a Kieran Kilkenny is going to make hay against that type of system. Now, they're going to cause teams bother themselves because they, they are really, really strong athletically. They're, they're very, very uh, potent at the moment, I believe, in the scoring front. But I believe Mayo's biggest problem over the last number of years has been simply that they have been so vulnerable at the back. And I don't say that because they have bad defenders. I think they have as good a defender as anybody in the game. And, and maybe they believe that football should be played a different way than me, but I, I just think tactically sometimes the way they play 
is very is is very is very open, and it puts their defenders under huge pressure, and they have to play so much, so much football to sometimes come out of games that they should be won uncomfortably, and I think that's why over the years lesser teams have perhaps beat them in the qualifiers or why teams are more competitive with them. So look, they're one of the best teams in the competition, have been for a long time, and no doubt probably will be for the next number of years. And um, they've unearthed a couple of really, really good young players. They have a really good blend. Um, they seem to really, really like James Horn as a manager. But as good as Galway are and as proven as Ross Common are, you're talking about a different level when you're talking about, at this present time, Dublin and Donegal. So until, until they play one of them teams, um, we'll not know for certain then. But they do play... Cork Tipperary in the semi-final, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So, look, they'll be thinking to themselves, Phew, we have a massive chance to get to the Lauren final. And I tell you what, one thing that we will never lack when they get to the Lauren final, they're never phased by who they play mm -hmm. and they're always hugely competitive. And uh, um, I, I probably like a lot of impartial supporters. I would love to see them want it, that group of players. You couldn't say that they, that they don't deserve to want it. But again, um, well, whether well, they can do that or not, but look, I suppose the reality is they only have one. They they, they only have one really, really, really big team to beat, and uh, psychologically they will know that. Yeah, because the problem may they had one in all Ireland maybe before. Well, none of this hype would be keep continue Mayo for Sam because iconic title probably for this team this year is a very good year. You know, James Horan putting a lot of new new lads, but because they haven't cut that All Ireland, the pressure's they're in an All Ireland final again. You know, the pressure's there to, to finally deliver it. Yeah, absolutely. Look, and that's that's the beauty of it. And them Mayo players, and in fairness to them, there is there is good a group of sportsmen that I've ever seen because they accept they accept uh, their defeat as as much as they accept their many many ones, and um, I think eventually that that Mayo side will come very, very close again to 1-0 Ireland and, you know, very much could do it. But, look, the, the, the unfortunate thing for a lot of the top teams at the minute, we're living in an age where Dublin are a superpower that we've probably never, ever seen before. And not only are they a superpower, they are showing absolutely no signs of, of, of relenting either. So any team that wins in all Ireland will have earned it because of Dublin being around at the minute. And look to to be to be blatantly honest with you, the fact that Mayo that Mayo team already hasn't won All Ireland is in many ways a travesty because they have, or they they really should have on a couple of occasions beat Dublin, and um, I'm sure they know that as well as as well as anybody else. But look, I suppose for them is when they go to play a Dublin or Donegal, they know they can beat them. And they know they can be hugely competitive with them because the past has shown that. And that's a really good thing to have in your locker. And then the final question will be, it's kind of easy and hard at the same time, but when you have Dublin, it's, you can always go to them. Who do you think will win the All-Ireland in the end? I think this year Donegal will win the All-Ireland. I think, I, I, I think I called it a while back and oh, look, you've already, you've already said it. There isn't too many people that are going to agree with me on that one. But again, I think this year, the way things are pot, the way things are set up, the way Donegal are moving at the minute, I think it's a year for a shock to a certain extent. But I don't think people should be too shocked that Donegal could win the Ireland this year. I think they're primed to win it. Um, they're playing arguably the best football. They've beat Tyrone already. They've made Armagh look really poor when Armagh were really not as poor as that. And they're going to play Cavan, who will be a decent enough team, still, still a decent enough team. Um, in many ways, their preparation is better than, than uh, Dublin from that standpoint. So um, they also will have more than likely Dublin in the, in the semi-final. I think they're better playing Dublin in a semi-final than they are in a final. So yeah. there's things in their favour. And um, the easy answer to give you is Dublin, but I'm going to give you my answer and I'm going to give you the only goal. This should be an interesting last month or so of the championship. But uh, Chris, thanks very much for coming on. No problem, Dara. Pleasure.